Welcome, everybody. Welcome uh, to uh, the community center here in uh, Tacoma Park. Uh, my name is Ronnie Galvin. Um, I am the executive director of Impact uh, Silver Spring, but I am not here to talk about Impact Silver Spring tonight. We are here. Everybody say, we are here. here. Y'all are looking way too serious out there. <laughs> we are here. Everybody say, we are here. We are here. Yeah, we're here to talk about the concept of local business, local economies, and some of the new and exciting things that are happening um, in the areas of local um, investment. Um, and so I say to you, good evening again. And I will say now, who lives in Tacoma Park? Wave your hand in the air like you just don't care. Okay, there you go. Right, right. So you already know this. For the, so for the rest of us who don't have the privilege of living in Tacoma Park, this next statement is for us. We are at the center of the universe and the capital of the world, right? right? At least for the next, at least for the next uh, couple of hours as we come together to inform ourselves and hopefully activate ourselves. Everybody say activate around a set of innovative ideas that could very well impact the social and economic future of our county, of this state, and dare we even say, what's up, Pastor Mark? How you doing, man? Uh, that's, my, that's, one of my, that's one of my pastors there. I got a pastor, a rabbi, imam, I got them all, I got them all. Um, and so we're here to really talk about um, our future. Uh, and some of the innovative things that are coming together that could, in, uh, that could impact that future. So let me just say this, because I'm going to get out of the way in a second, uh, but I think that um, we all would agree that there is an inextricable link between um, local business, local economies, and the neighborhoods that house them and the people uh, that live there. Um, at its best, um, the relationship between these things is deeply grounded in the principles of social capital. Everybody say social capital. social capital. It is grounded in an established sense of place and belonging, a sense of obligation to each other, and a commitment that goes beyond the bottom line to the greater good. With this as a background, uh, we would like uh, this evening to share with each of you, again, uh, the innovative an emerging set of practices and policies that are framed around uh, the rubric and the title for our convening uh, this evening, Local Investing, A Path to Stronger uh, Communities. We, of course, uh, would like to um, thank the Old Tacoma Park uh, Business Association and all the folks that are part of that association for helping to put all this together uh, this evening. Let's give them a round of applause. Yes, I met their executive director here tonight and some of the members of that organization, and we're looking forward to lifting you up even higher um, as, as these things around economic development come together uh, in um, our uh, community. Um, I'd also like to recognize a few folks in the house. Of course, um, we have our state senator here from District 20, who I'll introduce in a second, uh, Jamie Raskin. Let's give him a round of applause. And you know, we're all one big family. Everybody say we are family. We are family, right? We're one big family. We call each other by our first name. We got Seth and Terry here from the uh, City of Tacoma Park uh, Council. Let's give them a round of applause for being here. Um, let's see who we're missing. We got our uh, city manager here, Brian. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, we've got Bruce from Cheer, uh, and my pastor again, Pastor Mark from Tacoma Prez. Yay, I'll give him a round of applause. We got Evan Glass, the former uh, chair of the Silver Spring Advisory Board, and of course, running for District 5 uh, County Council. Am I missing somebody? Help me out. Oh, no, 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 I'm saving that for last. Trust me. Oh, yeah, we, we had a conversation earlier. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Schulman here, who is sitting on the front row is an expert who lives in this community, uh, is, has written about this topic of local economies, um, is recognized all over the country and all over the world uh, about uh, the topic, and uh, has the nerve to sit on the front row and say he's not going to say anything tonight. We're going to call him out. <laughs> We're going to call him out tonight. Let's give him a round of applause for being here. Uh, and we have, um, we have Steve Dubbs here. Uh, we, if you don't know their work, please look up their work. Uh, they're over at the University of Maryland. 
uh, with the Democracy uh, Collaborative doing great work, finally, uh, and not without a lot of effort uh, in our community, or at least in our region, and hopefully soon here in Montgomery County, uh, working on national models as it relates to um, um, local economic development. Let's give them a round of applause. Almost done, almost done. And lastly, of course, um, a, a longtime supporter of this community, lots of things that are happening um, in our neighborhoods, um, a supporter both financially and with her amazing spirit, uh, Franca Brilliant of the, of the Tacoma Foundation, who is not just Franca, but she's also brilliant. Franca. She's brilliant, Franca. Yeah, nobody's ever said that before. I know, I know. I had to, I had to get that in. All right, so, uh, so you, I, I'm, I just want to tell you, I got up at about 4.30 this morning. I don't have a lot of energy. Um, and so I'm, we're going to be drawing on you. And so, uh, so help us, help us tonight with, with uh, delightful, inviting faces as our panelists begin to soar uh, around um, the topics that they're going to bring to you today. So first, um, and I'm going to introduce them in order. Um, first, uh, many of you know her, you love her. Uh, her name is Lorik, Lorik, and I practice this all day, Sharkadian, 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 Sharkadian. Um, she is the co-chair of the local investing committee on uh, uh, OTBA. Um, her day job, by day, by day, uh, she works as the director for Community uh, Mediation Maryland. Um, she is a champion for uh, local economies. Um, has been a lot of the force and the will behind uh, a lot of the new legislation that uh, is coming forth. And I found out today when I got her bio that I have to address her now as Dr. Lorig. Dr. Lorig. She has a PhD from, uh, from Johns Hopkins uh, in uh, economics. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> this is Josh. Josh, what's up? Glad, glad you're here, man. Glad you're here. We were worried. We were worried. Josh Hopkins, not related to Johns Hopkins. Are, are you related? No, okay, all right, just checking. Um, he works uh, in the Loan and Technical Assistance Office at the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. And how do you pronounce the acronym? WACIF. WACIF, So we'll, we'll be saying that um, a lot tonight. Um, WACIF um, is going to be instrumental as an organization helping to uh, convey a lot of these resources that we're talking about today into uh, local investors and uh, our community. Um, Josh has uh, a BA in International Comparative Studies with a concentration in Global Market Studies from Duke and is currently pursuing an MS in Finance at uh, Georgetown. And that's a lot, lot of degrees there, man. <laughs> you need it for all that money Never you count. Huh? That's right, that's right. Never had too many. He's going to be talking about the uh, Tacoma Notes program. Lorg, I left this out. It's going to be giving us a general overview of local economies, local business, uh, and things of the like. Uh, third, um, is going to be, I think, our uh, state senator uh, who needs no introduction, but I just want to tell you that I see him as the hardest working legislator that I've ever seen, and a couple of times I've seen him talk in public, he sounds more like a preacher than he does a politician, <laughs> and I know what when I see one. Uh, uh, Jamie's going to be talking about uh, some of the new legislation that is passed to support uh, what's happening in local um, economies. Almost done. Uh, we've got so many people. Preston. Quesenberry. I got it right. Preston. <laughs> Quesenberry is also on the board of the uh, Old Tacoma Business Association and is chair of the Economic Re uh, Restructuring uh, Committee. Um, Preston's going to be talking about project based notes. And last but not least, everybody say last but not least, <laughs> is Larnice Bowen. Larnice Bowen. Uh, who is the, I got Larnice's name right, <laughs> uh, who's the founder and CEO of Liberty Drink uh, Company um, and uh, runs the business with your sister, with your sister, uh, and, and her mission is to make vibrant health the new norm, the new norm. And so she'll be talking to us from the perspective of an, of an entrepreneur in our community. And so these are your panelists. I'm going to decrease and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lauren, who's going to begin. Everybody say, no more than 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes about just a general overview about local economies and local invest investing and what's happening. If the speakers on the panel see me kind of stand up and move to the back of the wall, that means that you're about to get the hook. 
right? And so we want to, yeah. we just want to make sure we have enough time to, to leave it open for Q&A and dialogue with the rest of the room because that's where the real traction is because we are not here tonight just to get a presentation, but I think we're here tonight to continue to incite this movement that is emerging um, in our midst. So let's give Laura a round of applause as she comes to the microphone. We insist that Ronnie get up at 4.30 in the morning when he's going to do a panel for us because we can't take Ronnie when he's um, <laughs> full of energy. <laughs> when he's exhausted is about what we can handle. Uh, so thank you uh, for the introduction. The, so um, I'm going to give the brief overview of the bigger picture. And I need to say that um, it's a little, uh, it's a, it's a little nerve wracking to have Michael Schumann here because he is the one who wrote the Bible on um, this particular topic. And so um, I am going to, uh, and I'm going to try to take this and, uh, and this, the other Bible, um, and give it to you in less than 10 minutes so that Ronnie doesn't stand up behind me and give me the hook. Um, so I do encourage folks to read, I mean, if you're interested in the topic, there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there. There's a lot of really fascinating studies about why we need to do this work. Well, what I want to do is, uh, is highlight the, the reason that we need to be thinking about local investment. And then the challenges to why does it take an OTBA subcommittee a year and a half to come up with three different systems to allow for still pretty small scale, when you start to hear what the systems are, relatively small scale investment, and why this is really just the beginning of the bigger picture of the uh, change that we need to make in terms of how our economies function. So um, there's, a, there's, there's three key pieces I want to talk about, and one is that the, the issue that locally owned businesses are key to the health of a region. And I think that we all kind of accept that, um, but I want to talk about just a few things that uh, reinforce that idea, why we need to be thinking about that. The second is the idea that most businesses need access to capital to start and to grow. Um, and again, that might seem obvious, but we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, and then the third is, why is it so complicated for residents to invest in local businesses? So we'll talk a little bit about SEC rules and, and why that's complicated. Um, and so why, why do we need these structures and these systems in order to do that? Um, and, uh, and then a little bit about the kind of economy that we're hoping, hoping to build. Uh, I do want to say, though, it is a very cursory uh, overview that I'm going to give, and I do encourage folks to, to get to know more. So within these uh, these. Uh, these two excellent books. Um, so starting with this idea that locally owned businesses are key to economic, the economic health of a region, um, there's several reasons for that, but one of them is entrepreneurship creates wealth for individuals in the community, not just income. And so income is important, and we want people to have sustainable jobs with income, but wealth is also important, and it's important for the broader um, economy. And prosperity and opportunity, in addition to paychecks, are what create the strength of a local economy. So there's a range of, uh, of studies that, again, are highlighted in these books that talk about why how smaller companies um, are more have more significant impact on job growth. Um, and that's the case for several reasons, but one of the reasons is that the local company that's, that's, you know, uh, growing the food here or making the salsa here and is uh, owned by someone who lives here and employs five people is not going to pack up and move to China when they decide that the wage requirements in this community are too high. So that's like the stability of local businesses tend to stay local uh, is one of the reasons for that. Um, local businesses also pay local taxes. They're less likely to be avoiding taxes and tax shelters and, um, and hiding their money in the Cayman Islands. Um, they don't pack up and move, as I said, and they're also more likely to give back. Their, um, their uh, donations are more likely to be in the local economy. I just finished uh, on the committee that's raising money for the 5K, and you walk into every single local uh, store and you get either a $25 check or a gift certificate or a $500 check and anytime you walk into a business that's owned by someone who doesn't live here um, you have to file this paperwork and that paperwork and maybe you'll hear in six months about whether or not you have that donation so so while all companies tend to have some charitable giving um, the kind of money that's coming into the local economy is coming from the locally owned businesses um, but what's kind of exciting, this is a relatively new uh, article, and again, I'll, uh, I'll have it up here if anyone's interested in reading it. So this is uh, the Federal Reserve um, in Atlanta uh, published this article. And what they do is they looked at county economic performance between 2000 and 2009. So that included 
um, the period, hey Tom, that included the period with, uh, of the, you know, the crash of the markets and the recession. And they looked at income, employment growth, and changes in poverty level. And what they find, and I'll just give the, the quote and the summary quote, is that local entrepreneurship matters for local economic performance, and smaller local businesses are more important than larger businesses for local economic performance. So what that tells us from a broader economic development policy is that rather than um, the term that I've heard recently is smoke, smokestack chasing, um, right, trying to bring, you know, the subsidies and the, you know, the, the wooing the large corporations, the smokestacks that you're trying to bring in, chasing the smokestacks, really doing the local cultivation of businesses rather than chasing the big companies as the primary economic development strategy. So that, um, so that's, that's the kind of broader idea of why, why do we need to build local, local, uh, why, why local businesses are important for the health of the local economy. So the second thing is this piece about more businesses, most businesses need access to capital for startup and growth. So most new businesses um, get access to their initial capital from friends and family, maybe from the equity in their houses, from credit cards. Um, and often that's not enough to get started, or if it's enough to get started, it's not enough to grow. Um, uh, a lot of times then when it's time to grow, um, Small business owners may have minimal assets for collateral because they may have already put a lot of those assets into their into their businesses, and so their own assets or family assets um, are uh, maybe sort of tapped out already. But also, when we're talking about creating economic economy, uh, creating economic opportunity and wealth in populations that don't have a lot of wealth. So when you're talking about um, first generation of folks trying to build wealth, when you've got a generations after generations that have grown up in poverty, if no one you know has wealth and has assets, then there's no one to tap into um, for the building of the, the business. So you can't go to friends and family because all your friends and family are barely living paycheck to paycheck. And so the idea of creating wealth and opportunity and, 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 and business ownership amongst low-income individuals really requires that there's access to capital because the assets in those communities are, are even more strapped. Um, so there's several studies that highlight access to capital as a challenge for small businesses. And even when um, a business may have a relatively strong balance sheet or strong economic position, um, many banks don't want to make tiny loans, right? Because the transaction cost for the bank to make the small loan is the same as the transaction cost to make the bigger loan. And so they're either not interested in making the small loans or they're going to charge much higher fees to make the smaller loans than they are to make the bigger loans. And I'm realizing that I'm going to have to hurry up. Stay in your chair. Um, so, so just quickly moving to the next piece. Um, yeah, so even businesses who can get bank loans, and I know that the folks from Big Bad Wolf are here, and they're in the process of putting together um, uh, their their um, funds to, to for an expansion. Um, and then so one of, this is a conversation that we had. Even if you can get bank loans, you may need to get a mix of capital. So you may be able to get the bank loans, but you also need to get some private investment and and some personal assets. And so um, so that that's an important piece of the puzzle. The the, the access to um, the local investment is going to be important, an important piece of the puzzle, even for folks who have the ability to access bank loans. So why don't we just all start lending to our local businesses, right? Why can't I just go, you know, why can't Mark's Kitchen, when they want to do the expansion, just tell everybody that they'd like to borrow $1,000 from all of you, everyone writes them the check, and then, you know, two years from now, you get your money back with the interest. The quick version is that, S that when money is lent, and interest is earned on that money, whether it's a loan where interest is being paid or it's uh, equity in the company, it becomes a security and so it's regulated by the SEC. So you are welcome to give your money away, right? So you've seen the Indiegogo campaigns and many of you contributed to the Community Kitchens Indiegogo campaign. Thank you very much. Many of you contributed, thanks. Many of you contributed also to Lamano's Indiegogo campaign. So that was a gift and you got that cool, do you have your cup right there? You can hold it up. If you gave $25 or more, you got one of those cool cups. Um, but um, but if you but what didn't happen in any of those transactions is in the Indiegogo you didn't get your money back but you also didn't get any interest. You can also make an interest-free loan, so you can lend your money and the company can give you your money back, but there's no interest earned on that. And so from an investment perspective, from the idea of growing wealth in a community, keeping wealth in a community, investing your money, you can't do that with local businesses because it gets involved in um, complex security law where in order for the business to comply with the SEC requirements, 
would cost tens of thousands of dollars in attorney fees, making it sort of defeating the purpose of getting access to that capital through um, local residents. So, um, so, so what we've done over the last year and a half with the support of uh, Michael and others who have kind of laid out, here's the way to get around SEC laws, um, is we've come up with different strategies that will allow us to have, uh, so local residents can invest in local business. And in one case, we um, actually changed the law in Maryland, and that's the piece that um, that Jamie and, and Tom are gonna talk about. And so um, I'll end there. If people have questions about these things, we can take them after people have had a chance to lay out the, some of the specifics. Can you say the name of the book, please? Um, oh yeah, let me do it so it's on the TV, right? Local Dollars, Local Sense, and that's Michael Schumann. And, whoops. Uh, local vesting, and that's Amy Cortese. And then this is um, locally owned, do local business ownership and size matter for local economic well-being, and it's the Federal Reserve in Atlanta. It's a 2013 publication. Can we give Dr. Laura a round of applause? All right. So we just had a couple of people uh, come into the room. We had uh, State Delegate uh, Tom Hucker, District 20, come into the room. Tom. Glad to have you on the panel. He's going to be coming to the podium in a second after uh, uh, Jamie. We also had uh, City Council person Jared Smith coming to the room. Let's give him a round of applause. And another one of our kind of homegrown, locally owned, kind of global uh, businesses, uh, Blessed Coffee, uh, Sada, is in the room. Uh, the better half of Tababu. <laughs> I don't know how to have it to Bob who's in the room. Good, good. All right, I'd like to call uh, our state senator to the mic who's going to tell us a little bit about the legislation that supports all of this. And then Tom, you can jump up right now. Thank you, Ronnie. It's always dangerous to be in the same room as Ronnie. I, I was uh, at the Impact Silver Spring Breakfast the other day, and I was so carried away by his soaring rhetoric that I left $1,000 poorer, and I walked out and I said, oh my God, Sarah is gonna kill me. So Ronnie offered to let me stay on his couch in the basement. Um, but um, no, he's done a terrific uh, job with Impacts Over Spring, and um, uh, we're, we're indebted to you for your contributions to the community. Uh, so I'm psyched to be here with everybody to talk about uh, a favorite topic of mine. Um, and I'm just gonna structure my little talk around three interventions uh, by Lorig, I mean Dr. Charcutian. Um, uh, although the first one really began with another constituent, although Lorig was, was in the picture too, but it was uh, Jim Epstein who lived in Tacoma Park, and I was having a conversation with him, and um, I was finishing kind of the, the end of my first term in office, and he said, well, so, you guys have been able to get some good stuff done, but what are your frustrations? I said, you know, my main frustration is that um, that the business of America really is business, um, and yet we haven't figured out a way to make business work for the values of the community instead of in tension or in conflict with the values of the community. And he told me about this movement called benefit corporations, which were private corporations which made a private pledge to be involved in the community and to abide by what they're calling the triple bottom line, which was fair workplace values, commitment to diversity and fairness and justice in the workplace, um, environmental values, and then having a positive material impact on society. And I said, my God, that's, that's incredible. He said, there's you know, hundreds of businesses representing literally billions of dollars in investment that are part of this benefit corporation movement. And I said, that's incredible. Well, we, we've got to, have Maryland follow and create the possibility for benefit corporations. And he said, oh, no, it's not a matter of law. It's not real. They've just said it. And then I said, well, wait a second. You mean there's no legal recognition of this? And he said, no. And so I said, well, put me in touch with those people. And I called them up in Philadelphia. And I said, I heard about what you're doing. This is fantastic. But, you know, a corporation doesn't have to be, you know, a monstrous predator entity that is just focused on profit, we could write that into the law, what you guys are trying to do. And they said, well, we know, and this is part of our 10-year plan. And I said, well, let's make it part of the 10-week plan when I get back to Annapolis. Um, and I said, let's just introduce this and try to explain it to people. And, um, and in 2010, Maryland became the first state in the country to create benefit corporations. And the, um, the, the first benefit corporation in America is with us tonight, Big Bad Wolf. Penny and the gang. Uh, 
And uh, the second is in the house tonight, too, which is uh, Blessed Coffee. The Sarah and Tababu. Um, and there are, you know, the, these are the first officially legally recognized benefit corporations. But the movement is spread across the country. There are now 15 or 16 states, including Delaware now, which has come on board to, to say that you, that you can uh, make a formal legal commitment, not just to increasing profit, but also to increasing the social good and rendering a positive material impact on society, whether it's animal welfare and doing animal adoptions, or whether it's investment in education in the community, or cleaning up a local river or stream or what have you. It sends a message to your customers, to your potential workers, and to your investors what kind of company you are. It makes you anchored in the values of the community. And so people, it's a huge branding mechanism. It also protects the company legally because uh, Ben and Jerry's, for example, who are big fans of benefit corporations, said, you know, when we went public and then we get a, a takeover offer, if we don't accept the takeover offer, even if it's by a military contractor, we can be sued by our shareholders for not um, taking the best possible bid. And then we can be sued for the difference in shareholder derivative litigation. This protects people in that case. They could have said, if they'd had benefit corporations at the time in Vermont, they do now, but they could have said, we can't accept your bid because we don't think that you are going to faithfully serve all of the purposes of the company. So, th so there was that. And so I was very psyched about that. But of course, um, some of the companies that were, grow that were already going concerns, like the Big Bad Wolf, were already in business. And we think it gave them some kind of bump up in terms of prestige. And certainly, you guys have been growing. Um, but there were a lot of benefit companies that formed, but they couldn't find capital. And it's been very tough for a lot of smaller businesses to get off the ground. So that has been a frustration. Now, one way to do it, <clears throat> another LORIG project, which is the community kitchen. And we were able to get, your District 20 delegation was able to get bond bill money to help finance um, the, um, the community kitchen uh, right here in Tacoma Park. And that will be used both for community events and also for small businesses, for people who want to come in and rent the space for an hour or two and cater or do whatever they do. Um, but OK, so the last one, though, is the one that, that Tom and I just worked on in this past session that we got through. And this is based on um, some space that was created in the JOBS Act. And the JOBS Act um, was a way to uh, allow for crowdfunding, but at a kind of a, a very uh, a relatively exalted national level. But if you go under $100, um, we found, and we're the first state to do it, um, the, the state can say that businesses can raise up to $100,000 in $100 uh, investment contributions and then pay people back in interest. Because Lorig was saying you could make it a donation before and then you'd get nothing back, um, or you could lend it interest free. But this encourages people because then you, you've got an incentive, you can get some money back. And if worse comes to worse and the business doesn't work, you've lost $100 and it becomes a contribution. But imagine all of the small businesses that we can get off the ground this way, the 1,000 people putting $100 in, um, and suddenly that's real working capital that the businesses have. And uh, well, we're going to hear from one of them tonight. I'm sure you'd be able to do some amazing things for your smoothie business with $100,000. And I'm putting my $100 in because I love smoothies. That is my favorite thing. So. Um, <laughs> So, um, but, but, but the real thing um, is, this is kind of the big political picture for me, and I'll close with this thought. Um, you know, President Obama has said it. We, the, the principal moral and political issue of our time is inequality. Uh, we are not living in a time of poverty. We're living, living in a time of staggering wealth, but the wealth is just very badly distributed. Um, we have greater inequality today than they had in the Gilded Age in the 1890s and early 1900s. I mean, staggering corporate profits today. But then we have millions of unemployed people and people who can't find a way in. And so um, you know, it's great to try to organize around that. And we increase the minimum wage and so on. But we've got to figure out alternative economic structures that give real opportunity to people and real sustainability to the community. And if you go back. And you look in the 1890s and the early 1900s, that's just what the populists were doing. They created a political movement to try to challenge the stranglehold of big corporate wealth, the railroads and the utilities. 
um, and to break them up and to have antitrust and to institute campaign finance laws and so on. But they also did what we're doing, which is they tried to build economic cooperatives and movements at the bottom where people could depend on the community for sustenance. And also, as Ronnie would be the first one to tell us, not just for the economic benefits and the economic opportunities, but for the cultural and social opportunities that are offered for people to be in contact with their neighbors and to be engaged in the community and not just to be in a relationship with Wall Street and mega corporations that are all over the world. Like we want a human scale economy and we want a human scale democracy. So that's why I'm so excited um, that uh, Silver Spring and Tacoma Park um, and uh, the people here have brought us these ideas because these are the best ideas we get, the ones that come right out of the community. And then we are able, when we get them done, to bring them back to us. And um, we're hoping to create new structures of opportunity and growth and democracy. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so what else uh, to add? I was texting Jamie a minute ago saying, how do you want to divide this up? So, but no, you left, you left me plenty. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really a pleasure to work with Jamie in Annapolis. And uh, we're a good team. And uh, we managed to get these, this bill passed, I think, unanimously in both chambers, right? Which is, which is, yeah. Especially, I mean, you rarely, you don't see that that often, but you rarely see it with any bill that, uh, where you could say Maryland is the first state in the country. And in this legislation, with this approach, to Lorg's uh, credit, uh, Maryland is the first state in the country to take this approach to crowdfunding, and it's really groundbreaking. And you know, I'm I'm amazed that uh, we, it passed with with so little uh, opposition. It was all just really smoothed over by, uh, and I had a lot of colleagues, uh, including the conservative Republican that sat next to me uh, on the committee, saying, "Oh yeah, you know, she came by. I just I had all my questions answered. I didn't have any." Any issues at all, and I'm kind of, you know, checking what's what he's drinking. Um, um, yeah. Um, um, so, if you, uh, so Jamie mentioned some of the parameters of uh, the legislation. Let me just uh, uh, fill in a couple more. Um, we worked closely with the Securities Commissioner of Maryland, who's under the AG uh, office, and Jamie had a close uh, relationship with her to begin with. Um, so he did great work to 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 um, get her on board. And to get her, I think, you know, in Annapolis, in a very busy session when we're considering 2,300 bills, they get a lot of requests. And to get her to spend the amount of time she spent, it was really a victory as well, and part of the part of the um, the reason this passed. Um, so uh, she was comfortable with the approach that was in the bill. We came came forward with a lot of amendments, and and uh, here's where we ended up. Um, investors have to invest up to $100, um, no more than that, and the aggregate a business can raise is up to $100,000. Um, so, with, and, and then the third requirement is all those investors have to be in Maryland. This is infra, intrastate loans. And if they're under $100 and you raise less than $100,000 and they're all in Maryland, you can pay interest and you're not considered a security, right? Is that accurate? Yeah. So that's, um, you know, that's really groundbreaking. That's terrific. And so think about the, the uh, and you have to pay um, a $100 filing fee to set this up once um, they are ready to begin registrations, and that won't happen until after October 1st of this year. Um, but we're moving forward, so this is a big victory. So think of the applications. Um, you might be um, uh, selling your produce at a farm market, or you might be selling something you manufacture like jellies, um, and you might want to have better labels and a better website and a better marketing strategy. Now you can raise money from all your loyal customers that you get to sign up on your sign-up sh sheets. You might be able to sell it online now. You might be able to sell it uh, in the winter months uh, when, when you know, their farm markets are closed. Um, other things like that to build up a small business. You might be Charlie Garlow with the green commuter, right? Is that a good example? Where you got a real... Um, I was there for the ribbon cutting, and Charlie was so assiduous in his care for the earth that we didn't cut a ribbon because that would increase our carbon footprint. He found, I wouldn't have thought of this, much more creative than I would be. He found an invasive vine, <laughs> and he braided it, and he made it much tougher than we could have ever, and, and we, we had a hack at it for a while, but we got it cut. Um, but, but the green commuter... Um, might want to have a big new marketing strategy. It might want to uh, open up and and build into the back lot. I don't know. Maybe you know. You tell me. You tell us what you could do with a hundred thousand dollars. You've probably thought about it. Expand. Yeah. Expand. Right. Um, so 
now, since we're all in Tacoma Park and we're loyal and we care about the environment, we care about local businesses, we can invest up to 100 bucks in Charlie's project and we can grow it even bigger. And then we're not putting our money in Wall Street, we're putting our money on Carroll Avenue, right? right. Um, so that's a medium-sized business. Um, bigger businesses, you can imagine, they could do this too. You know, anybody with a loyal following, the Tacoma Co-op, right, Greg? <laughs> think, think small. But with 100,000, uh, my point about the co-op is you got a big list, you got a loyal following, you have conscious consumers, you're not giant. You have people that would, yeah, we want to see the co-op grow. I wouldn't loan giant 100 bucks, but I'd loan you 100 bucks. And then if I can get 101 back or 105 back, I'm psyched, right? Because I feel like I'm investing locally and I'm a conscious consumer and I'm investing in my local small business. So even a bigger business like that, I think it, it pays off. But this week, I, I, I actually talked to folks, uh, and I found an application I wasn't expecting. Um, I was approached this week by the inventor of a new wind turbine. And they came to see me because I sponsored the offshore wind bill in Annapolis. So we finally got passed. And I've met a lot of the folks that have the terrestrial applications in Western Maryland, the little residential turbines, and the big 12-mile offshore giant turbines. Um, but this is a whole different one. This one has a smaller footprint, and it looks like a chimney and you can attach it to the side of a school or anything else, and it uh, funnels the wind from all directions downward into drum turbines that spin like crazy and generate electricity locally, and it's not an eyesore, and it doesn't kill any birds, and it doesn't have a big footprint. So it has all kinds of advantages in tough, you know, tight urban settings like we, we have. So he comes to me, and he, and he shows me the residential versus the commercial energy rates uh, in various states, and he shows me um, all these different applications and the schematics and how this all works and how fast the turbines spin. This is great. And I'm all psyched. And then I said, okay, so what do we do next? How can I help? And he's like, well, I just need to raise forty to $60,000. I'm like, what are, you what are you talking about? I thought, I mean, he's got the whole works. He's got a whole PowerPoint and cards and everything. No, there is none. He needs a prototype. He doesn't have one yet. So he's, you know, he wanted my ideas on what he could, uh, what help he could get from the Maryland Energy Administration and what other help he could get in, in raising capital for a prototype to show people this actually works and tinker with it. So of course I said, guess what? We got a bill for you um, and you're gonna be able to do this in Maryland and you wouldn't be able to do it anywhere else in the country. So they're gonna start raising money for their groundbreaking wind turbines. After Use, October 1. After October 1. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's been a pleasure uh, to work with this team. Uh, it's, re it's really an honor and I'm very excited about uh, watching where we go forward with this. If you wanna look up the bills on Franca, on, on your laptop or anybody else, it's House Bill 1243 and it's Senate Bill 8, 810? 811. 811. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm Josh Hopkins. Uh, I'm a student of finance. Uh, I feel like I'm at an AA meeting, sort of saying, you know, <laughs> a finance guy. Um, but no, in, in, in all seriousness, I'm, I am a student of finance. I'm, I'm doing a master's right now in, in finance, in addition to working full time. I worked at U.S. Treasury. Um, when I left, the last issues I was working on were small business and community development finance. Uh, started in economic development, working with uh, someone you all are very familiar with, uh, Senior Kenner here. Uh, back at the city, and currently I'm at Wake of the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. Um, and frankly, you know, I have to say that financial service industry works pretty well. Trillions of dollars move every day, back and forth between very large institutions. Um, and the capital market is pretty efficient. You know, you can pull up on your, on your iPhone today, your E-Trade account, and if you decide you wanted to buy some shares in GM or GE, you could do it in a, you know, a few clicks of a button. Right? Seems like it works pretty well. Um, the only issue that I think we all sort of can agree with, and thank you for the folks who came and said something before me, I don't have to do much convincing, is that it only works well for a particular segment. Um, I think we've seen the financial service model and the intermediaries that exist really have shifted from one of providing capital such that it actually yields social impact and benefit to one that yields mainly profits, profit for their institutions and profits for the institutions that they're raising capital for. But they've got various and vast segments. You've got the equities markets, you've got debt markets, you've got all sorts of hybrid 
markets that I'm still trying to understand. Um, but I th what I think we have, and while we have some, some really great f pieces of legislation that start to take these models and bring it down to the local level, we've got some existing infrastructure today that we can act on right now where we can start taking this capital marketplace and bringing it back to what it was all about, about funding uh, long-term, uh, deep-rooted social benefit. Um, and when I said I was a student of finance, it's not just been sort of at the large capital market level, but these two books that Lor uh, Dr. Lorig <laughs> put forward are actually the two books that I have sitting right on my bookshelf at the top that I've recommended our board uh, read as required homework that any time I'm working with folks, I, I, I recommend. I know in, in, uh, in um, Local Vesting, Amy Cortese or Cortese's book, it's chapter six, and in uh, uh, Mr. Schumann's book, I forget what exactly the chapter is, but community loan funds, right? Is it around chapter six, perhaps around there? Community loan funds exist as this sort of, you're going to check me, aren't you? I know it. I know you are. Um, community loan funds exist in a way that represents a particular segment of local capital markets, not dissimilar from what some of the large banks do for large corporations, but they can act in a way to actually create an, official capital, uh, an efficient capital marketplace for local small businesses today. And, and I'll tell you one uh, specific way in which we do it, and an exciting new opportunity that we've just, I think as of 6.15 p.m., been able to officially ink, uh, which is this idea of a community loan fund that takes capital, aggregates capital, and uses it to provide uh, uh, loan capital directly to businesses, can now um, issue securities of their own, a, an efficient process. Companies won't have to necessarily, and this is a, and it's a fantastic way to do it, companies issuing their own securities, equity securities, or debt securities directly. But what we do is we're in the business of doing this. We're in the business of dealing with you know, 50, 100 different investors who all want to know a little bit about what's going on with their investment, who want to ensure that there's some risk protection around that investment themselves and that it's going directly into their community. There are community loan funds that exist that do that right now. And by issuing securities of their own, they can actually seed and um, uh, attract community capital and create a community capital marketplace where that, that capital is actually fed right in and directly into uh, into local businesses. And so what we're excited to announce today is that OTBA and WACIF, the organization I currently work for, the Washington Area Community Investment Fund, has entered into an MOU. Broadly, it's branded as a neighborhood investment initiative. And of those initiatives, the first, the pilot, just like with uh, benefit corporations, it's going to be with Tacoma Park. It's going to be this sort of Maryland, D.C. Uh, connection. Yeah, absolutely. This is, taking, this is taking chapter six of your book and bringing it to life. Um, this has not been done in, in a vacuum. Like I said, these two, these two books and, and contributions from, from other folks have really driven this sort of effort. And so we're, at, we're right at the precipice. In fact, I'll just, what I, I can show you a, uh, a sample of the first prospectus. I don't see many of these anywhere in the world. A prospectus that provides potential community investors the opportunity to, direct, uh, to invest directly into their communities. And so what we're looking to do is provide a security, a debt security, that will allow a moderate level of, um, of return on your capital. We can protect the risk by doing the underwriting and working with businesses and being gentle and flexible in ways that banks typically aren't in their loan products and invest in companies here that will then uh, add a social as well as financial dividend to the community. So what we have right now, what I can provide, uh, and I have some of them up here, are these sort of interest cards. Um, they're self-addressed. So if you want to take them home with you and share them to other people or photocopy them and then mail them to us, more than happy to. But we've got a little bit of background on who we are as an organization. We've been around for 26 years and we've been doing this for 26 years. We've provided 18 million plus um, in loan capital to local area businesses, uh, the types of businesses that provide jobs, and, uh, and affordable housing and, and, uh, and child care directly to, to the communities here in the D.C. area. Uh, but we're, we, we have these cards and you can fill them out. You can give them to me tonight uh, and we'll put you on the mailing list. And when we are ready, once we've gotten past all the securities registrations and we have a completed prospectus, we will uh, mail you uh, or email you the investment application and the prospectus so you can participate in something right now. So here's a great opportunity. 
in connection with uh, the Old Tacoma Business uh, Association. And we're really excited to see what this is going to mean for businesses right here uh, and as a model to, to, to use nationwide. So thank you for having me here to make that announcement. Okay, um, so we are getting into the areas of actual securities now, so um, I feel somewhat constrained in what we can and can't say, as Josh was indicating. I do have my lawyer in the room, so I'm careful in terms of what I'm going to say and, and not say here. Um, but just to build on what Josh was talking about and to try to kind of differ differentiate the various vehicles, um, in with, with the neighborhood notes that Josh was talking about, um, Wake will issue the notes and community members can invest in those notes and their money will go into a loan pool and the that that money will be used by WACIF to make loans to um, local businesses, but they will be vetting the businesses, screening the businesses, um, and it will basically be a diversified pool. So if, if say we raise a half a million dollars, there'll be there could be a pool of you know ten to fifteen however many businesses. So there'll be some diversification there. Um, and the ultimate decision as to who that money will go to will will be up to WACIF, WACIF, um, WACIF. I keep, I can, it's been six months and I haven't gotten that right yet. But, uh, and they're, they're going to prioritize, the, if the money comes from Tacoma Park, they're going to prioritize the greater Tacoma Park area. So that will include uh, Tacoma Park, the city proper, as well as uh, the Langley Park corridor and the Long Branch corridor down Flower Avenue, as well as the um, down on Fenton Avenue, the Fenton Village area. So it's going to be, and Tacoma, D.C. too, yeah, sorry. Uh, so it's the, the great, we're calling it the greater Tacoma area. Um, so that's that vehicle. Uh, and again, that'll, it's a, a pool of funds that has some diversification, and the ultimate decision as to the, the project will be up, um, up to Josh and, and his people. What Old Tacoma Business Association is offering is the opportunity for community members to support specific businesses in Tacoma Park. And it will, so if, if you want to invest in a particular business, OTBA will offer that opportunity. And the way this, this program will work basically is that local businesses will apply to OTBA for a loan. And OTBA will process that loan application. Um, in particular, an, a loan review committee will process the application We'll look at things like credit, profit and loss, um, assets, business plan, other financials, and we'll approve the businesses that meet the loan guidelines that we've set up. Now, as just as a caveat here, the majority of the people on that loan committee are just going to be volunteers without any particular commercial lending experience, um, but we'll be doing our best to do some sort of vetting as to that particular loan. And once OTBA has vetted the business, what we would expect to do is commence an offering in which Tacoma Park and other Maryland residents would be able to invest in OTBA notes that would finance a loan to that particular approved business. Um, so you'll know exactly which business the money is going to and for what particular project. Now, OTBA is also exploring the possibility of an offering that would allow DC residents to participate too, but as of now, Maryland is what we, what we know for sure, and then if we decide to open it up to DC residents, uh, we're going to update that. Uh, both in our in our website and through through emails to let you know if that opportunity is available. So all of the funds raised from the community through the sale of the notes will be lent by OTBA to the approved business, and the community investors will be paid back only if and when the business pays back OTBA. So, um, you know, and, and in general, I think OT, you can find out more information about these particular offerings on OTBA's website. And then also, we're going to be sending around emails that will, on the various listservs, we pretty much are tapped into all the various community listservs, so you guys should be keeping your eyes out, and we'll let you know when an opportunity and an offering comes up to invest in a particular old Tacoma business. And this all probably seems relatively straightforward, um, but I, th I think the reason that you're not seeing this sort of thing done in a lot of communities, and I'm not aware of, of any that have done this exact thing, um, is the problem that Laura raised, which is securities laws. That they're very complicated. Um, and OTBA is a charitable nonprofit, so it's less complicated for us. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're an intermediary in this, 
uh, situation. But there still are a lot of legal hurdles that we would have to work through, and we couldn't do it without um, having experienced securities lawyers help us through the process. And fortunately, OP OTBA was able to find a top-tier DC law firm, Covington and Burling. They volunteered to provide us with uh, legal services on a pro bono basis to be able to help us dra draft our prospectus, get our notes ready so that we'll be able to launch, launch the project. And that I uh, have our attorney, Adina Lord from Covington and Burling's here. So I want to thank her. Um, and we've also, there's a local community bank, Colombo Bank, that, that has been, been very helpful. And they're going to help OTBA out with some of the procedural aspects of the process. So I don't think we have anyone from Colombo here. But um, they've been a lot of assistance as well. So I want to thank them. Um, and so just to, to sum up, with the, with the three vehicles, we've got uh, the Wake If vehicle, where you'll be investing in a loan pool um, of, that will be prioritized for Tacoma area businesses. You've got the OTBA project-based notes that will allow community members to support particular businesses in, in Old Tacoma with OTBA as an intermediary. And then the third vehicle, um, what Jamie and Tom were talking about, that will be when the businesses themselves, without any intermediary, they can just directly issue securities of their own that Maryland residents can invest in to support those businesses in $100 increments. So those are the three platforms. And they may, I think one of the things Lorik mentioned, be used in combination. We may get Colombo Bank providing some of the money. Maybe Wakeif would provide some. But you know, OTBA needs to step in. So having all these different vehicles, I think, will help finance a variety of projects. Hi, everyone. Ooh, moving. Um, so, yes, my name is Larnice Bowen, and my sister and I are starting a smoothie and raw foods company, Liberty Drink Co. Um, we are actually Washington, D.C. natives. We grew up really close to Tacoma Park, to the point where I actually thought we grew up in Tacoma Park, and my mom was like, no, it's actually Brightwood. And I was like, oh. Um, so didn't have the privilege of living here, but I'm super close by. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about like why we decided to become entrepreneurs and sort of the spirit that I see throughout this um, metropolitan area of millennials and other people really looking to have a positive impact. I think that's definitely something that guides a lot of entrepreneurs. Like we, especially, you know, we're millennials, which we kind of get a bad rap, but I think a lot of us are actually, which I think is unfortunate, because a lot of us are actually really looking for like new systems. We realize that there is a tremendous amount of inequality um, and we want to work to address that. And we are looking towards sort of alter alternative economic systems. Um, and so I think being as a business owner, you have the, the ability and the opportunity to really um, create a certain culture in your in your environment and that supports locally grown um, local businesses, for example, in our case, farmers, <laughs> and um, you know really sort of move away from the profit driven model um, that has been unfortunately the dominant sort of ethos <laughs> um, um, in this culture. So um, we want to have like again we want to have an impact so my sister and i we're looking so we're starting smoothies raw foods juicing and all that it becomes super trendy and um very popular but it's really not affordable um not everyone can afford to pick up a juice or a smoothie that costs 10 plus dollars and that's something that we're very um cognizant of and we're looking to sort of um through our we haven't launched yet i guess i should say uh, we're sort of in our soft launch, so we're, we're product testing and we're getting out there and getting people um, excited about our products. But um, there's sort of a local scene here um, that is looking to reduce waste. Um, grocery stores oftentimes have really high like standards as far as the produce that's on display. Though oftentimes, if a, an apple has a small bruise, they'll throw it away. Um, consumers are very picky about um, what they're willing to pay for and want it to have a certain aesthetic. So um, a lot of times they say like even like a lot of stores will, will build in waste into their budget as high as like 11 percent. So across the country you'll, you're seeing nonprofits and increasingly small businesses like social socially minded businesses that are looking to reduce that that waste and to take some of that food that's perfectly viable. It's perfectly viable nutritionally, 
but it just does not meet certain aesthetic requirements. And so we're looking to, there are um, organizations here like DC Central Kitchen, um, there's also Social Enterprise um, Farm to Freezer, so that are looking to reduce this. And so that's something that we're working to incorporate into our model. So how can we reduce waste, make these products more affordable to everyone who doesn't have you know, a certain level of a discretionary income? So um, those are sort of like the, the thoughts and the ideas that are motivating us. How can we create a certain culture for example, um, a local company here, Sweet Green. <laughs> um, I'm sure you guys are familiar. They have amazing salads. They were started by Georgetown students. Um, but one of the differences between them and us is they had access to certain to wealth, quite frankly, um, that we, we don't have. So they were able to expand very quickly. But um, we, we don't own a house, so we can't put that up for capital. So that's why I think these initiatives, especially I thought the crowd sort, the crowdfunding initiative is really compelling. And it's something that I had actually like thought about. I was like, what if we could just like get like 50 of our friends together and just have them lend us? And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. So <laughs> it's nice that, <laughs> well, unfortunately we're a DC based business, but um, I'm like, why didn't we incorporate Maryland, right? But that's gonna be hopefully the next frontier. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, Sweet Green is this awesome company. Like, their culture, they're very much about, like, supporting local. They're super creative. Um, they, like, have amazing, like, community events, like the Sweet Life Festival. So they're definitely, like, a company that we're model after, but we just, unfortunately, we do not have the access to that, to that network that they have. So I think that these kind of initiatives are really great because they do help support local businesses who maybe wouldn't have the access to that. Like, I'm working full time. Um, and my sister is working mainly on the business. And so we're sort of di di dividing our time up that way. But obviously if we had, like our, our startup costs are really reasonable. We were very intentional about how we created our model. Um, and so right now we're starting off with like delivery options so that we won't have to have a, a space because obviously rent is high. So um, our startup estimates are only about between 10 to 13K depending on how 10K is like the bare bones, we just really bootstrap it. <laughs> 13K is a little more like, okay, we'll have like a nicer website and things like that. Um, and so it's possible, like these, these loans, these um, can really have a great impact on a business. It could really help us get to the next level a lot quicker than um, where we are right now. But I mean, we're still making progress, not to say, but these, these um, initiatives definitely can have an impact. Um, so, yeah, uh, just excited, happy to be here. Hopefully DC is next. Um, and thank you for having me. Yes, and state your name, who you're with, so we know who's in the room. I'm with the Georgetown Business Association Economic Restructuring Committee, and I want to make a comment. Preston very modestly described our loan committee for um, the Tacoma project notes. And it was a very modest description. I do want people to feel a little bit comfortable about who's going to be vetting these loans. We have the vice president of Colombo Bank. We have a person who's been the vice president of Fannie Mae for 17 years. We have me 30 years in the mortgage business. It's not, it's not just some volunteers. I just wanted, to, I just wanted right. to say that. I also want to say one more thing. The Tacoma Project notes are very high risk. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Pastor Mark. Yes. Hi, I'm Mark Reiner. I'm pastor at Home Park Presbyterian Church. It may not be fair to ask Mike Schumann a question. He's sitting in the Sure! Park we park told him this was going to happen. We told him this was But in one of your books, you talk about, I believe it's the state of North Dakota. I don't remember which state for sure that has, has the state level of banking. And so I'm, uh, I love the initiatives that are happening. But I'm also wondering about that next greater level of banking and what can happen. I'm wondering if you could talk about the model and if Tommy and Jamie, if you could, or Tom and Jamie, if you could talk about if that's possible in the state of Maryland. Um, so, so the public bank is a 80 year old, 80 plus, maybe 90 year old institution uh, where North Dakota set up an entity uh, where North Dakotans can basically put money into the state and it gets reinvested. But the most interesting piece of it is that every state has money that flows in and out of it. It flows in and out from taxpayers, it flows in and out from government transfers from the federal government. 
And nearly all states, including the state of Maryland, does its banking primarily with larger institutions, mm. which means that that money is systematically reinvested in Malaysia rather than in Maryland. So public banking, at a minimum, is a structure for taking that money. What North Dakota has done is put much of that money on deposit in local banks and credit unions through the state. So the degree of credit availability for small businesses and individuals in North Dakotans is one of the highest in the country and has been like that for years. And it's one of the reasons why, North, besides the fact that they're there, they've got an oil rush right now, <laughs> North Dakota has the lowest unemployment rate in, in the country. So I think there are things that could be done in Maryland to implement this. Now, public banking people have even more ambitious ideas, but I'm going to just leave it at that for now. So, sure. Well, um, Pastor Mark, you and I are thinking right along the same lines. Uh, and I, um, I think it was three years ago now, um, started to talk about the public bank, and I heard about the North Dakota experience, and it's an incredible thing. I mean, it's an just an enormously successful bank. Um, you know, in a, in a time when all the other uh, states were running these huge budget deficits, they had a big surplus. Now, they did have the oil, too, but the bank was also part of it because they were investing local, um, and they were there for the local economy. Um, so I started talking about it. It caused like a huge fury among the banks, the private banks in Maryland. So I turned the bill into just a bill to study it, to study whether the North Dakota experience could be replicated and to what extent could it be replicated in Maryland. And um, it never got out of the Senate. It went to the Senate Finance Committee, uh, which may be our most conservative committee. And I was only able to get three votes for it. Um, but I did unify the entire banking establishment against us. Uh, and uh, although what's interesting is that there were some smaller private banks who said, we've got no problem with this. Because in North Dakota, the private banks aren't really opposed to it. It's the big banks that are being ousted. And the North Dakota bank is investing in the smaller banks and helps to farm out some of the business. I mean, there's you know hundreds of millions, billions of dollars that run through the state coffers, as Mike was saying. Um, you know, all of the time. And that's money that could be shared among the smaller banks. So I think the politics of, our, of it, we got to figure out a way to get the community banks to buy into it. And then if we get them as part of the coalition, and then we're just nudging aside Citibank or, you know, one, one of the giants. So. No, I mean, I don't have much to add, but uh, yes, uh, Jamie's right. Um, I serve on the Economic Matters Committee of the House that does all the banking legislation and the insurance and other business uh, legislation. And um, yeah, this idea is, Michael's exactly right. It's been, been around for a long time. This is a progressive era reform in North Dakota. We're not living in the progressive era. Um, and so the, uh, there has been this bill in the House Economic Matters Committee for, for several years. There have been other iterations of it. David O'Leary is here from the Sierra Club, and I met with them a year or two ago about doing a green bank uh, along the lines of something Connecticut had passed just to narrow the lending portfolio to in, uh, renewable energy infrastructure, things like that. Um, Jamie's exactly right. Uh, just like the health insurers didn't want a public option, the banks, of course, don't want the state to have a state bank. And so, of course, they, they are with among the most powerful lobbyists in Annapolis, and they lobby furiously against any competition. Um, so, you know, we don't, like in many er areas, we don't have a policy problem, we have a political problem, and we really need a sort of united and educated public behind this idea before it's really going to move, because, you know, it just takes a banking lobbyist or two to come in and say, well, they have this only in North Dakota, and that's only half the size of Montgomery County, and, you know, obviously this is a wingnut idea that would never work in Maryland, and many of my colleagues roll their eyes and Jamie's exactly right. You might get three or four votes, and that's about it. So that's been the history, unfortunately. And there hasn't been a lot of advocacy um, effort behind this bill, unfortunately. There's you know a, a few groups, but but not many. So um, we need to change that calculus to, to make it move, in my opinion. Yeah, but I, so the question's a really good one also just because it uh, um, one of the things that I didn't get to highlight that I think is worth highlighting is that this is just the very beginning, right? I mean, like the kind of structural change that we need to do to 
our local economy, our regional economy, and then, you know, the entire country and the world. Um, this piece that we're talking about today is the very beginning, and it's uh, these pieces were relatively straightforward to, to make happen. But we start here, and part of what we're doing is, like, we're practicing putting our money into our local economy. Like, part of what we've talked about is... We're starting to build the habit, I and mean, we're hoping that what we do is we build the habit to, of doing this here in Tacoma Park, and then that spreads. But there's a lot of broader structural things that need to change. The state bank's one of them. Um, even the possibility of thinking about most of these are, all of these are debt-based, um, or debt-based, um, but really thinking about equity-based strategies and, and uh, co-ops and worker co-ops. Um, but then even eventually uh, local stock exchanges, right, where, where once we're, we all are owners of the local companies, we're ch trading our stock in the local companies locally, right? So we're knowing each other and we're looking each other in the eye and we're, you know, the relationships matter based local economy. Um, and so I want to make sure we're thinking about this as like the first step in the right direction and the practicing of how we need to be being um, and, and all of these other possibilities that can then, that can then come from it. Yes, ma'am. Hi, sir. Hi. Thank you. Um, I, this is, I know you're talking about finances, but I like to talk about people also. Um, I don't know, a lot of you, I don't know if any of you know that if you hire a handicapped person, in the state of Maryland and the register with the Department of Rehab Services, like my son, you will get a, some kind of a tax rebate and that they will also be provided with a job coach to help them. And my son needs a job, so, and a lot of other disabled people, so just letting you know. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, sir, Mr. Hausman. Uh, yeah, Tony Hausman with Safe Silver Spring. I'm very excited about the different ideas that have been talked about today. In terms of just the programs that are immediately on the agenda, each of them sounds great. Um, they're, we've just got into them in a sense. I'd like to see something written that gives us more details about them and the pros and cons of, you know, what, if we want to go with one versus the other, <coughs> what, what are the advantages for an individual? So a question for the panel, is there like an ongoing, like is there workshopping around this? If somebody wanted to get technical about this, how would they, how would they do, how would they do that? Yeah, that's Yeah. Okay. Um, I can, I can speak most specifically to the Neighborhood Investment Initiative, which will be um, a, 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 a debt security. Um, so I have a little chart, and this is going to be used uh, in conjunction with the prospectus. The prospectus, for, for folks who haven't done too, too many uh, investments, it provides you with, uh, it's like a comprehensive guide to let you understand what it is you're undertaking. Um, so it outlines a number of the risks that are associated with this sort of investment, gives you some background on us as an organization, um, uh, our history, how we've been capitalized. So what mix of, 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 of debt and equity we have. So you don't know that, you know, to make sure you, you know that you're not investing in a Ponzi scheme or, you know, something like that, right? Um, but one of the other critical things it does is it provides a little bit of perspective on the note itself that you're purchasing. Uh, one thing I'm putting in here is a comparison table uh, between what we're offering and some uh, generally similar products. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview of what, what it'll look like right now. Um, you could go out and invest uh, in an index fund in the markets and make somewhere between, you know, right now, what, 8%, something like that, year-on-year -year returns. Um, you could invest in some, God, I don't know what the treasuries are trading at right now, but maybe a little bit lower, around 4%, something like that. You could put it in a savings account um, and make, what, zero, exactly, one-tenth of 1%, right? Right, depending on how much you have in it. Dep the more you make, but the return on it, exactly. You may make, exactly, the, 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 returns, the returns on it sort of stay the same. Um, the products that we're offering, these sort of social notes, there are only but a few right now that are sort of in this category. Uh, Calvert, which is another Maryland organization, has a note. Um, TRF, the reinvestment fund, a Philadelphia-based, uh, it's a billion dollar community development financial institution. Um, and another organization on the West Coast called RSF Social Finance. Now, there may be others. You may know of some others. Those are the only ones I, I was able to find. Only, only national ones. 
Oiko Credit. That's another one, and that's an international uh, an international organization as well. National Housing Trust. See, this is this is why. Uh, clearly, I didn't do all my homework. I did about seventy five percent. But yes, there are a few others out there, um, and those the ones that I mentioned: Calvert, uh, TRF, and RSF Social Finance are international, U.S. or at best regionally focused. Um, TRF, which has a mid Atlantic focus, um, is uh, is probably the one that's closest in terms of direct impact. Um, and when you look at the interest rates that those notes would provide. Calvert, you're looking at um, a year investment may yield half of half a percent for three years, a full percent, five years, one and a half percent, seven years, 2.25 percent. You sort of see where I'm going, right? TRF, uh, in the third year, one and a quarter percent, um, five years, two and two quarters percent, seven years, two and three quarters percent. Um, and RSF social finance, in five years, you could yield 0.83% return on your initial investment. So it's better than a savings account. And in fact, I'd like to note, when you look at this and you're thinking through your entire uh, sort of wealth pie, I wouldn't recommend putting 100% into any one of these, uh, but think about it in terms of perhaps what you might invest some of your savings, your savings account savings, um, uh, and perhaps a, a, a either a CD or, or some of your cash. But the returns that we're looking at offering, uh, in one year, 1%. Uh, in three years, 2%. In five years, 4%. In seven years, four and a quarter. And in 10 years, 5% return. Um, so when you look at it, the effective annual rate is, is in a lot of cases, double or uh, really between uh, half a percent and a, and a full percent uh, each year, effective annual rate of return. Somewhere between half a percent and a full percent return. This is better than a lot of the stuff that we've seen out there, and the investments come uh, right here into your communities, stores that you'll be able to frequent and shop in yourself. So just to give a little bit of perspective, that will be included, what I just went through will be included in the prospectus, and I encourage everyone who's interested to really take a look and familiarize yourself with what the note structure will be. When will the prospectus be oh, available? Um, It'll be available as quickly as ah! <laughs> I can get back to my computer and finish it, and we get clearance um, from the uh, Maryland uh, uh, securities. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Very good. Good. Do you want me to speak to that? Come on up, so sure, 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 sure. Um, so it's pretty much the same story with uh, project-based notes, uh, and that there will be a prospectus. Um, when we approve the loan and when we issue the notes, that will disclose the terms of the loan and the, and the various risk factors to consider. And the terms will vary um, depending on the particular business we're lending to. The interest rates may vary and the term of the loan may vary. And all of that will be disclosed in the actual prospectus that we're going to issue when we do the offering. And um, again, the, the plan is, is that we would, when we actually, when a business applies, we approve the business and we're ready to do the offering. We're going to try to publicize it both on the website and through emails. And there'll be a general request form that um, residents will fill out. And once they fill out the request form, we can see that the Maryland residents, et cetera, then we can send out the prospectus and the other materials so you can assess the, uh, the risk and the interest and the terms and maybe compare them to other investment products. Well, it will be because, well, we don't know, we're gonna, as I said, we're exploring DC as well in terms of registering or notifying in, in DC. Um, yeah as well. And, and so right now we know uh, the, the notification process is a little different in Maryland, but we know, um, we know the plan is for Maryland and we hope DC as well. Um, so. Jamie, yeah, please. Well, to explain that the, the Maryland crowdfunding one, the, um, the Maryland Securities Commissioner is going to issue these regulations and the businesses will have to um, extend the offer to their customers or their supporters pursuant to what the regulation says. But presumably they'll come back with something like, you know, um, you know, green commuter bond will be issued for a hundred dollars and payable at X percent interest, five percent interest over a two-year period, or whatever it might be, and you just comply with the regulation. And as long as you're complying with the regulation, which will be issued uh, in October of this year, then um, then it's acceptable. But yeah, all of these I think are debt securities. These are all bonds. So. It, it, and that's really how we're able to do this and not be covered by the federal securities laws because they're not equities. You're not buying a piece of stock in the corporation. So. 
Lord, did you want to jump in? Dr. Lark, yeah, yeah. Last last one, then we're going to move to the next one. Last one now that everyone's spoken. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, but in answer to your question, Tony, I think about like what are the next steps, right? That was your, so um, so next steps is pr very quickly we'll have uh, wake if notes available and um, there's limitations on how much OTBA can promote. The, I mean, there's just there's the legal stuff about how much them without becoming brokers, right? I mean, that's the issue. Um, so definitely you want to get connected there and then OTBA and others, others, I mean, not limited to OTBA can kind of put on their website, you know, like this is available, go to the WAKEF website for that. So, you know, if other organizations that are in the room are interested in doing that, that would be fabulous and that's going to be online soonest. Probably next will be the project-based notes and then in October individual businesses will be able to, to do the $100 uh, exemption. Um, but the, the flip of this is that we're also looking at what kind of um, work we can do to support businesses to know how to tap into this. And so this is kind of the broader here's what's going on. So we have businesses here, we have potential investors here, um, organizations, elected officials. Um, but like Ronnie and I have started talking about um, the training that we might put together for uh, how to use this new legislation, $100 exemption piece for all the circles that Impact Silver Spring works with, the, the entrepreneurial circles. And we're looking at how do we do it with all the people using the community kitchen, you know, where, like places where we're likely to find people who would want to use it um, to develop training for that. So I think that's the other sort of next step is to figure out how to make sure that small businesses know how to tap into the various um, pieces that, that are available or are about to be available. Thank you for that. It's about 8.30 now. Who had dinner tonight? Who didn't have dinner tonight? Raise your hand, right? I think we need a smoothie. Don't we need a smoothie? How, how do we get those smoothies? Just You didn't tell us that. Check out so, our website, uh, www.libertydrinkco.com, and we're also on Facebook. And how do you spell Liberty? L-I-V-I-T-Y. Good, good. Just want to make sure we got you a shout-out in there. All right. What other questions do we have? What other questions? Yes, sir. And then Seth, I'm okay. Who's going to bear the administrative cost under this Maryland community investing law, keeping track of all these tiny investments? It sounds like somebody could invest five dollars or a dollar. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> which, Wait, one? which one are you? Which one are you? Hey, I'm talking about, about the Maryland the community money. investing law. The crap. The, the, well, the oh, the, oh the, the businesses themselves. Besides. Yeah. So. So you know, say you're, you're blessed with coffee, and they could decide to sell in whatever increments they want, $100, up to 100 50 25 10 what have you. And then it's a matter for them to do the bookkeeping. Isn't that going to be a pretty significant cost to a small business? Yeah, well. Uh, the, the way that I've imagined it, and the business I've talked to, and you could jump in on this, is that it would be unlikely that you'd issue them for less than 100 because that would well, kind of be You can't normal. issue them for more than 100 right? You can't. You cannot. Because you're not. But, but I think that you probably wouldn't sort of amortize it and be doing payments like monthly on the, I mean, you'd sort of get $100 from, um, you know, 20 people, 200 people, whatever it is, you'd have your spreadsheet with who they are and you'd probably pay it back at the end of the year or the end of two years with whatever the interest rate is. That, that's, I think, the simplest way um, to set the structure up. I, I think that you wouldn't do it as a complicated monthly payment. Like it would be, and it wouldn't be a rolling process. Well, it wouldn't be then. worth doing it monthly, but That's even right. doing it once a year, probably going to be a pretty big burden for a really small business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if you to speak to that. Like a, I what, mean, I think the funds would yeah, make absolutely. it worth it. I mean, <laughs> it's difficult that. being a small business owner. You get creative, you make it work. I mean, I think, you know, we're a DC-based business, so we can't, unfortunately, take advantage of the opportunity, but as soon as it comes in DC, we will be right there. <laughs> and we will accept $100, you know, we would not have it in smaller increments. No, that would be difficult to track, and I, like you said, it wouldn't be worth it. Somebody but, testified about this actually and said that you've got to do the accounting anyway. And so, you know, you have an accountant or someone who's doing it. Yeah, but usually in accounting, the work's largely the same, no matter how many sort of zeros are behind the number. And if it's, you know, it just seems to me like a hundred dollars is too low. You should have made it a little higher than that. Yeah, we couldn't according to the federal law. Well, that's, it's actually, I mean, it's the balancing act was this, that because we were taking away all of the, um, all of the regulation, um, 
there's this balancing act of the reason the regulation there is there is to protect investors. So the reason that you have to file the paperwork and continue to file paperwork is to protect investors, right? So that you're not investing, you know, fifty thousand dollars and then you lose it all on a bad on a bad deal. So the balancing act in the hundred dollar investment was uh, hundred dollar exemption was Mike's idea as well as a couple others, right? Who put it forward initially that started the crowdfunding at the federal level was that hundred that if someone loses hundred dollars, you make a bad investment. Um, you're, it's not going to kill you, right? I mean, there's some people for whom that would be huge, but uh, but for most people who are going to make that investment, it's it's not going to kill them if they lose the hundred dollars. And so you protect investors. You basically have no regulation on those investments. You protect investors because they can't lose very much, and you give a business an opportunity to get access to that capital with no regulations. But they don't have the regulations, but they do have to figure out how to manage the hundred dollars. So that's kind of the balancing act with it. And I, I think you're right; it's not for everybody. And I suspect that er that there'll be people who will be raising twenty, thirty, forty thousand. Even though you could raise a hundred thousand, I'll be surprised if a lot of people raise the full hundred thousand with it. But I think I've talked to enough businesses, ones here and there's others in the room, who have said it, it, it uh, you know, that it's it's worth doing, that it's worth, you know, having the law. Um, even though there'll be people who will say, you know, it's not worth it for me to do that as well. Seth, I'll grab you in a second, Joshua. Yeah, um, you know, and, and I think, uh, Dr. Lloyd, you, you, you made some... <laughs> we love that. <laughs> you earned it. You paid for it. Uh, so they paid you. <laughs> I, think the, I think the key thing to consider here is the, um, this is, it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all yeah. approach for every business, right? The, the sort of individual who may have a sole proprietorship may not necessarily have the time nor the bandwidth nor the infrastructure set up in order to work with... 5,000 people have all contributed $100 to capitalize the business, right? Um, so one is, is figuring out that it's not going to be for every business. And that's the beauty of, I think, the wide array of opportunities here that the panel represents because you do have other organizations like OTBA and like us who can serve as those intermediaries that can sort of aggregate the capital and, and an organization like us will have the bandwidth and the ability to negotiate and get to the end result that's that's necessary, which is capital provided to the local business to work. The second point is, it's been beautiful to see how technology has evolved in a short period of time to facilitate some of this stuff. We're actually working right now, because we're doing basically this. We're looking to solicit you know, a large number of small dollar investors that we will then use, and we've looked at our processes and our infrastructure to say, can we necessarily handle it? So we're working right now with um, uh, a trustee organization, Bankers Trust, out of uh, Iowa that has built um, technologies uh, for much more efficient interface between organizations and investors uh, where you can facilitate that investor communications um, process in a way that you could if you were a large organization but they focus and concentrate on much smaller organizations so I wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of years as more and more people start investing locally as, as, uh, as SEC regulations come forward so that crowdfunding can really truly be uh, a model for equity-based investing for things like this, uh, this legislation that's passed in Maryland really becomes an, a, a, thing, a working, breathing, living thing that if the market doesn't respond and say, hey, let's build some technology to support this because we see some real opportunity here as well. Very good. Seth, yes. My comment is actually uh, was partly going to be the same as Linden's, uh, that I think it's very difficult to manage a lot of small investments. Maybe you're willing to do it if you're hungry enough. But there was also something that wasn't said, which is I think it's a great model to accept small investments, loans, whatever, because these people now own, even if you got to pay it back, they own a piece of your business. They will have an incentive to talk it up, to go patronize it themselves. I gave some money in the people mentioned the Lomano Indiegogo campaign. I gave some money in it and I go in there two or three times a week. I feel like I own a piece of that, even though I'm not going to see that small bit of money back. So that's a, that's a real benefit here that hasn't been discussed. But I think Josh was getting it, an answer here. The reason we don't know about crowdfunding in the sense of donations, Indiegogo, Kiva, different purposes, uh, Kickstarter, is that they are platforms that you can go sign up for with a few clicks of the mouse. It takes you a, a few minutes to do that. Uh, you don't have to deal with all this paperwork of keeping spreadsheets. Keeping spreadsheets with 200 names. Do I have the latest version of the spreadsheet? Is it backed up? All this, that is, that's not workable if you try to scale this thing. Uh, the real question here is, what are you doing or what can people do to help move along the development platforms that will serve as mediators or marketplaces for these loans? 
Now, the platforms are going to be different from a Kickstarter or a Kiva in that they'll have to be limited to Maryland investors. Mm -hmm. There'll be some certifications. We won't give it to Anthony Brown to take care of. But, <laughs> watch it, watch it. But, uh, but yeah, it can't be done. And the, uh, even the state of Maryland can't do it. Uh, there are plenty of uh, people in the private sector who can do that. So I would encourage you to try to find uh, a platform that can support this in a timely manner. There's some, some time to do this. Uh, they'll take a small cut of the land, you know, it'll be 3%, 5% or whatever, but uh, people who do crowdfunding have been willing to pay that. So my comment there. That's good, that's good, that's good. Yes, ma'am. Just, uh, my name is Penny Jones, and I'm with the Just to build on that, um, you know, I think it's important to here in the D.C. area, which I, I invited Karen Jane to come here tonight, and she had a conflict, but it's called Clovis, and they only do local investing. Mm -hmm. they built, it's two young millennials, they're brilliant young guys, who have built a platform, and they actually administer paying back the loans on a quarterly basis. So that might be something that would be interesting to look at in terms of having a local company who can come in, they've already done the infrastructure with the networking and, and having people sign up and then saying, okay, we're dispersing this much back hmm. over this period of time. They, they've built it already, so. What's the name of it again? Clovis. Clovis, got yeah, it. Yeah, Clovis. And Kiva Zip is a great example. And um, I'm gonna talk to you more about Kiva. That's great, outstanding, outstanding. So we got all the ideas and information right here in the room. Yes. And just to note, we actually have been working with some of the people involved in Clovest, and they're really <coughs> interested and have been really helpful to this process. So there is already some of that conversation Good. taking place. Karen is great, great. Yeah, if I could just clarify the difference, though, the, with Clovis, they can't pay, right now they're not paying interest to the right. investors, right? So you're, the business pays interest, and the interest covers the cost of Clovest. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. can't pay interest to the investors because, again, that's where it becomes a security. It's an SEC issue. And, and that's where yeah. these structures are the way that we've figured out how to get around the SEC regulations that prevent Clovest from being able to pay the interest. Yeah, I'm just thinking about in terms of a platform. It's a great platform. I just. Because it is onerous for a business to have to track that, that many different accounts. So it's kind of looking at, again, going back to an electronic platform where you can take it in, it can be divided, mm -hmm. keep track of everyone, and disperse the funds easily. Mm. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, my name is Nadine Block, and I have a, 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 a related object, a related item to share with people. There was also a movement here to come apart to start a credit union. There hasn't been a credit union in Maryland and started in 30 years or so, and that's standard for across the nation because of repressive laws from the banks, of course. Um, and we are working also with a group in D.C. who is working at rather uh, re-democratizing, if you will, a credit union that already exists. And the credit union in question is Lafayette Federal Credit Union. Um, we have managed already to get two candidates onto the ballot for the new board of directors, which meant we collected uh, petition signatures. And we are now looking to get people who are either members of Lafayette Credit Union already or who are willing to join. You only have to put 50 bucks into an account to be a member. Then you're eligible to vote. You have to vote in person. Uh, part of the big problem is that it's at a uh, fancy schmancy um, country club and you have to be there in person to vote on May 17th. We are arranging rides for people. May Where is it? You have to join by May 10th Where in Virginia. Or, but everybody, I mean, where is the credit union in general? It's all, we, anybody here can join it for various reasons. Mm -hmm. If you belong to the co-op, you can join. If you want to join the American um, Consumer, Consumer Council. Council, you can just say you want to join the American Consumer Council, costs nothing, and then you're eligible to join Lafayette. So if you're interested in helping us on a smaller scale, try to build local capacity in an alter, another way, as well as investing locally, mm -hmm. come talk to me afterwards or talk to Emily. We're actually working on this group and it's very exciting because we managed to get two people on the ballot for the, it'll be the first contested election in many many years so uh, there's lots of ways to work this so really I thank you all for all your fabulous work it's all really really exciting so thanks the group in DC is called DMV for credit union democracy and the website is DMV for CUD.org yeah, by the way, we did have a hashtag for tonight, but it's kind of too late. <laughs> it was uh, TK PK Loca.
vesting, right? That's what we came up with, loca vesting. So if you still want to tweet, you can. We got still got about 15 minutes or so. Any other questions, comments? From, I think we're running out of steam, we're running out of steam. So I, yeah, I have, I have a question just because I'm, thorough, I'm thoroughly confused about these things. And so, so there is, there are the Tacoma notes and then there are the project notes. One is the businesses are issuing, and one is you're issuing. Did I get that right? Do you? Well, um, so that one is. I just the three of them. One is uh, Wakefield is issuing the notes. Okay. The That's other one is OTBA is issuing the notes. OTBA. And that will be for a particular, just one particular business. Right. Um, for one particular business. Right. Okay. And then and the then third one would be the business itself. That's the hundred dollar. Is yeah, that's in the, after October. After October. Let's not talk about that right this second. <laughs> Do you see a scenario where there's a there's a limited pool of folks who are willing to invest, and you start either competing or cannibalizing each other? You know, this I shouldn't is, ask that no, question. No, this is, I mean, this, this is, were y'all think Were y'all thinking about that too? Okay, yeah. it wasn't just me. Okay. I mean, this is an interesting question. I know uh, Patty and, and and Preston. I think we sat down and chatted about this, uh, we've sort of looked at this at length. And really, I think a lot of it comes down to, um, in some cases, investor appetite. Really. Um, while ostensibly you have the same pool of businesses that was benefited from the capital, you have these three different vehicles and three different models. And, and I think investors will almost sort of self-select based on <coughs> their desired intention. Um, the, the Tacoma notes offered by OTBA will be direct into business. So you'll know, you know, if it's, you know, Mike's coffee shop at the corner of, you know, XYZ streets, um, then you can invest directly in there through that vehicle. Um, if you want to invest in a note, it's going to an intermediary uh, that will target uh, businesses in your area, but also perhaps look a little bit more broadly. And you're saying, look, the relationship I want is with the intermediary itself. Um, and there's a certain set of um, risk protections that, that are inherent in that that aren't necessarily the same. Now, you know, my, my finance professor would stop me if I didn't mention the relationship between risk and return. But in a lot of cases, the return that you might see in a riskier project and you'll, a, a different level, level of return that you might be more comfortable with. You know, you can look at something that's, that some of the risks are mitigated a little bit more, uh, but you wouldn't make the same amount of return. So again, this is sort of the self-selection. That occurs. The third thing I think with the equity side <clears throat> to consider um, is if you were to trade notes right now in, let's say, uh, GM, uh, shares of, shares of, uh, of GM, uh, you can trade it with another individual. You might want some GM shares. I've got some I'm willing to sell it to you at this price. You say, I agree. And we can do that exchange. It's a pretty liquid market, right? Cash can move pretty quickly. Um, until such a time comes with the equity investments, that opportunity to receive cash for that stock uh, is still something that uh, you know would need to be sorted out. And that part of that can be sorted out directly with the company itself. The other part is, I think, to Lorix, um, is perhaps pushing and moving the marketplace toward an exchange whereby there are buyers and sellers. And that's, again, part of the sort of step up and ways in which, again, all of these different vehicles really work in tandem to support a really effective, um, uh, complex capital marketplace that meets the needs of both the businesses as well as the investors. So, so self-selection, I think, is the, is the sort of moral of, of the story. Got it. Thank you. So I'm going to grab Laura, and then we'll pick Mr. Shu. No, I think that I, I, that's mostly it. I think the only other thing I would add is that, um, you know, we all talk about it, uh, diversifying your investments, and so there's the need to do that both like move it out of the large corporate places where it's probably invested a lot of it right now and into the local scene, but also even within the local scene. So you might want to have some high risk investment in, you know, in one business and some direct investment in another and some like pooled risk in wake if. And so I think it's very likely that rather than sort of competing with each other, we'll be uh, moving and creating more options that are helping people have diverse investments all locally. So it won't be like you could have high risk locally or diverse at an international level. It would be like you can have some at an international level and some diverse at a local level. Can I just say one more thing? Oh, Michelle, usually the higher risk, the higher the return. And not in the case of um, the Tacoma project notes. 
you will get much less of a return and much greater risk on those than you will in anything else at all. Right. So I just right. want to be Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Because so you're the, the purpose of the Tacoma Project notes are to help businesses that have no other way to get funds. They are specifically designed to help businesses start up that have a good business plan, good credit, and assets, and we will hope some security to offer. Um, but they won't have a track record. They won't have um, tax returns that show a profit. They won't have profit and loss. We'll be taking a big risk. What we'll be saying to the community is, like for example, with Lomano, which did not raise funds this way, raised them through the Indiegogo. We'll be saying to the community, okay, Tacoma Park, you want a coffee shop. Here's a coffee shop that has good business plan, good credit, and they happen to have a, uh, experience in the business that they're in. Here's a very high risk. You can help these people start up. Well, people did that with the Indiegogo. The only difference with this is they will be vetted, and you will get a very small return on your money. The very small return on your money is how we're beginning this process. As we go on and see how we do and see how successful this is, we might be able to offer more return on your money. But really, the intention is to help businesses that need help that are already existing, they can't get it anywhere else, and to help the startups. And just one other thing that I want to say, businesses fall naturally into one of the loan places, places to go for loans. There are some businesses that if they walked into Wake If and said, Josh, can I have a loan? You'd say, go to Colombo. You can get cheaper money at a bank because you've got everything you need. And then there are some businesses that Josh will say, we couldn't lend you money at all. And then they have to come to the to come project notes, and so on and so forth. Mr. Schumann, and then uh, Senator Raskin, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Oh, Steve, Steve, we got to get you in the Senate. So let me, let me reformulate that. Mr. Schumann, Steve, and then uh, um, So there are, I think there are three facts that are really helpful in thinking about what, what we're talking about tonight. So the first fact is all of us have in long-term investment $30 trillion. Now, the U.S. economy, about half of all the jobs are in local, small and medium scale business. So if that capital market were efficient, half of that money, $15 trillion, would go into the half of the economy that is locally owned and has all the benefits that Lori talked about. Right now, almost none of it does. Almost none of it. It's 99.9% .9 goes non-local. So it's a completely broken system, and this is a really important first step in fixing that. The second point is that uh, last year, Nobel Prize in Economics was won, won by Robert Schiller. He is a bit of a contrarian, and if you look at his website uh, at Yale and do the math around rates of return of Wall Street since it was founded in 1871, the typical annual rate of return is 2.6%. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these big numbers, I mean, we have great memories for years where we got 8% rate of return, and terrible memories where we lost 20%. <laughs> so you've got to really look at the long haul in all of this. And, and by that yardstick, many of the things we're talking about tonight look really good. The third thing to think about in terms of risk is we know from the experience of community banking that the best way of lowering risk is not to rely on exotic computer scoring, it's to actually know the person you're putting your money into. And that's what this is all about. It's one of the principal defects of the Jobs Act, that we're encouraging lots of people to put money at long distance. I think in Maryland, by now encouraging and in fact demanding through this law, that you put money into someone you really know and care about, and we've heard from some of those folks tonight, we're going in exactly the right direction. Nice, nice, nice. I told you we yeah. don't get you in tonight. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I don't know if there's that much to add to Michael, but uh, you know, there, there isn't, right now you have the, the choice of investing in NASDAQ or uh, the Dow Jones or, you know, International FTSE or what have you, um, and that is, vehicles don't seem to crowd out each other and, and, and the point that, that Michael just made, you know, makes up. So there's 
huge amount of market space, and, and I don't think there's any worry whatsoever that these three vehicles are going to crowd each other out. I just want to close with two points. One is that on the, the I, I appreciated the, you know, the candor of your um, statement about what the real risks are and the real returns. But I, I would propose one amendment to it, which is when you say there's a really small return that you could get, we're, we're, we're not thinking they are global enough about what the real return is. And I mean, I get that kind of goes to Seth's point. I mean, we want uh, blessed coffee to thrive. We want, uh, you know, the big bad wolf. We want Larnice's uh, business to be flying, both because we want the smoothies and we want the pet food and we want the coffee, but we want our neighbors to thrive. And um, so, you know, when, um, uh, you know, when Ronnie says, well, are these different funds going to be in competition in some sense, you know, and maybe what we really need is a local investment mutual fund so you can invest in all of them, you know, somebody will come up with that. But in truth, the way I see it is like when lots of us locally are running for office, and we're all, we all come with uh, our cup in hand to say, you know, can you contribute to our campaigns? And so many people give something to all of us. And, you know, in my campaigns, I've always done it just like what I think Larnice is going to have to do. It's a let's have a big dance. Let's have a big party. If everybody can give me 100 bucks or 50 bucks, that's great. Invest in me and I will go to work for you. And people own a little piece of me. And, I, you know, I don't take money from corporations or uh, partnerships or lobbyists or, and they don't want to give me any money anyway, don't get me wrong, but uh, I, I, you know, so I'm really owned by the community and you're going to be owned by the community and these businesses yeah. are owned by the community. That's what we want. And we want to, I think, blur those lines between commerce and culture and politics. So anyway, I, I love what these guys are doing. So, so we're about to wrap up and we're going to wrap up uh, a little earlier than we thought, a few minutes earlier. Uh, he snuck into the room. Um, our brother here. Uh, tell him who you are, just so that so they know who you are. Dewan Hope. I'm gonna tell him. Dewan Hope. Well, uh, he's a sidekick of Pastor Marks. They go. They like uh, Ebony and Ivory. They like Ebony and Ivory. <laughs> and Dewan uh, is, is a good good fellow in our community. He's also running for a D20 uh, delegate. Thanks for for joining us tonight. So let me just say this: the audacity of you. The audacity of you. Dr. Lorick, right? The audacity of you, OTVA, the audacity of you to do something, and the, we, this word came up a bunch tonight, to change the structure, right? We're not putting a fresh coat of paint on it or a nice bow on it. We are challenging the structure of our economy. And I just want to tell you, right, me, me and my wife, y'all have heard this story a thousand times, some of you, we, re, we, we relocated here from Atlanta, Georgia. And we, one of the main reasons we did was because we believe that this is a place that has the courage and the uh, imagination to do the kind of stuff that you're doing uh, right now. There, sure, there are a lot of challenges that we have in our community, and we're going to talk about them. Everybody say, talk about them, but not tonight. Not tonight, not tonight, not tonight, right? But when we do stuff like this, when we do stuff like this, we are demonstrating to the world that we are one of the most loving, one of the most progressive, one of the most, uh, Pastor Mark, beloved uh, uh, communities um, in the country and maybe even on the planet, the audacity of you to believe that, that we could do this. And I'm glad that you have the audacity. Let me just tell you, when I was in seminary, um, I had a professor, the first day of seminary said, I hope that God makes our problem so hard that we gotta think about it. And we got, it will force us to do something different. And perhaps that is what has happened in our midst, right? We see what's happening with the middle class. We see what's happening with struggling folks. We see that 400 people control more wealth than 180 million people. And the folks right here in this room and who've been working in the state capitol and all in the streets of this place have said enough is enough. And in the midst of all this pain and struggle, this beautiful uh, set of policies and practices is emerging in our midst. And Dr. Lorig, I love it, Dr. Lorig. Not, not Dr. Laura. <laughs> Dr. Lorig, Dr. Lorig. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We are, 
at the advent. We are, at, we are just at the beginning of the road of this kind of democratized, I think Garbovitz calls it this democratized economy where everybody can participate and generate wealth. And so let's remember tonight, what's the date? First of May, the first of May, uh, we are a part, uh, what's that? Oh, no, Lord, we're not even going to touch that. I can preach that. Let me have some time, right? But the point is, is that we are making history and we are making a way together so that everybody can participate um, in our economy and in our democracy. Can we give OTBA a round, another round of applause for their courageous leadership? Dr. Laurie, Jamie, everybody that's been involved with this. Pastor Mark with the kitchen. Thank y'all. We're going to make history. We're going to make a way. We're going to show folks how to do community and do business and love each other at the same time. And on that note, hug five people before you leave this room. <laughs>